I had no one else to compare myself to. Like I wasn't comparing myself to any other 22 or 23 year old out there. In fact, I thought I was doing pretty good. So I was like, hey, I've come out of university and I've got a job. Whereas now you got people who are like 16, 20, 21 who are just making a killing. And I think because they're so out there on social media and they have gained quite a lot of following because of the success they've had. I think a lot of guys maybe that age or even a little bit older, they're like, hang on, how has this guy managed to make so much money and so successful? And I am literally doing nothing with my life. Michael Thurston, welcome to the show. Hello, Chris. Good to see you again. Thank you for letting me use your house to record this in. What do you think? I know you're a bit of a connoisseur of uh, setups when it comes to podcasting. What do you think of this one? I think it's really nice. Uh, I'm loving whatever that is. Some old school, old and worldy telescope type uh, light. I think that's very nice. Very well done. I'm impressed. Nice. You've entered the dark <laughs> and dingy world of podcasting. podcasting. Yeah, how are you finding it? I'm finding it good, actually. It's, it's probably been one of the things which I've learned the most out of like what it's taught me so far from just having conversations with people doing research about people and being able to hold a conversation it's it's been very interesting well you've done youtube for a very long time how long have you been on youtube now first video went up 2016 it feels like longer than that but no, i guess no, that's a, still that, quite a long time yeah it was yeah, i went hardcore in 2017 that's when it kind of took off so what looking back now and obviously having this big arc of content creation for the last coming up on a decade mm. being on a platform which is getting ever more successful ever more popular more and more people joining mm. more and more people being competitive what have been the principles that have managed to get you to not only a stage that you've got a sizable platform but also have managed to help you avoid being dragged into the muck and the mire and the politics and the backbiting and the reaction videos and the call outs and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think you've, draw, done a, yeah. you've done a very good job of avoiding mm. that. I think I've never really been massively opinionated on anything. I'm quite neutral. And I would keep, like, say, for example, a lot of my content training related it would just be about the training. I would never call anyone out or say anyone else's name. It would just be what I believe you need to do when it comes to training, building muscle, losing body fat same thing when i transitioned to vlogs and lifestyle it was mainly just either about me and what i was up to or the place that i'm going to not about the people is that a purpose-built strategy to avoid getting yourself into politics or is that just i think natural? so i think i generally just don't like drama i would like to avoid it if possible mm. why because it's just just don't like it stress stress and i think um I think it's petty. Once like the drama starts, it's like backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, and it never really ends. And then sometimes it can get a little bit like so, some people might say something they regret. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do something or make a video where I look back and think, oh, that was a bit stupid and childish. Yeah. What about the principles? What else have you done? You know, looking back on the, the come up to get from where you were to where you are now. What? Just be myself. I think you see a lot of trends over time. And people tend to try and like hop onto trends or do what other people are doing who are really popular. But I just stuck to doing what I do and I feel comfortable doing. And I feel like that has worked massively for me. And The problem that people come up against, I think, is first off, if you're playing a role, like if you're trying to be someone else or your version, like YouTube Mike or YouTube whatever, you get found out pretty quickly because people are always going to look for hypocrisy or discontinuity between who you say you are and who you actually end up being. Yeah. And the other side, I think that we're both pretty aligned on is if you're not careful, you get known for the drama and nothing else. Yeah. You don't actually get known for your work or your takes or your expertise or your insights or anything like that. What you get known for is like, okay, when's the next reaction yeah, video yeah, back yeah. and forth thing coming? And that's and like a really bad situation to be yeah, in. Yeah, like... The prime example of that in the fitness industry would be Greg Doucette. And fair play, he's doing his thing. That's obviously his business model and it's working. He's getting the views. But like you said, that's, that's kind of what he's known for. And that's not something I would ever, I wouldn't want to be known for the guy that has made a platform or generated a, a big following just from doing reaction videos for other people. Mm. Would you watch Greg's content if... It wasn't sometimes like... No, I, I do watch some videos. Yeah? 
Yeah, because he he might just do like a, a a reaction, or it's almost like a a news channel now. When someone in the fitness industry has done something, or something's happening, or usually it's negativity because the negativity brings in the views. Mm. And there's been a few times I'm like, ooh, that looks like some juicy gossip. So yeah, you do I, need someone. To, you do need someone to go out and find out what's going yeah. on. I suppose it very much is kind of like a news feed for the fitness industry. Mm. I suppose Derek does it, but Derek has a. I guess he hasn't done it as much recently. I guess he's onto bigger things now. Mm-hmm. But in the past, he used to do that. But it was- he grinds. He, I mean, dude, I, I've got to watch because obviously my housemate was a big part of Derek's Liver King video. Mm-hmm. So Zach Talander is a guy that I live with. He did the Charlatans playbook section of that video. And his editor, Alex, was the guy that actually put the whole thing together. Mm-hmm. And I watched them work yeah. on this thing for fucking ages he did a very good job of ages it. and ages man and i'm watching it happen and unfold behind the scenes and i, I wouldn't have surprised me if derek would have asked me to sign an nda i, mean, I didn't need to because i'm not <laughs> going to tell anyone about it or spoil it but they worked so fucking hard on that thing mm. um and yeah i do think that derek's a particularly good example of someone that just decides okay here's my expertise mm. i'm gonna go at this thing the problem is that there is a a little bit of fall off. He's inevitably going to get himself embroiled in some of those politics. Yeah. Right. Because of the type of content that he's doing. Obviously one of the things, one of the things that Derek did recently, uh, him and Matt did, does fitness. Yeah. Cause the last time that we spoke was about two and a half years ago, mm-hmm. a couple of miles in that direction, I think. And we were talking then and all of the like, is he natural accusations that have followed you since we were in uni, basically oh, yeah. like 15 years ago. And I think that one of the concerns that you'd had then was, well, no matter what test you do, there is always going to be somebody mm. that says it's insufficient, it's not enough, it's blah, blah, blah. And I think Matt had that problem too. Matt mm. went to Derek and said, design me the most rigorous randomized testing protocol in the world. Mm. Is that something that you yes. use? <laughs> I've emailed Derek and I've WhatsApp Derek two months ago. Right? No reply. You're kidding me. <laughs> yeah. You're kidding. Yeah. I'll show you after this. Because I spoke to, obviously I've seen this all happening. I've been watching the videos. I speak to Matt. He's like one of my best friends. Yep. And um, Matt was telling me, because I asked for his number, Matt was saying, uh, just be aware it's a massive ball ache on both ends because he has to be available to do all these random tests. He's got to pay for it. But then Derek has to do so much organization. You know, he's getting things set up in a country which he doesn't live in. And the whole process, you can't just do all these random tests in a, a week or two weeks. It has to be over a four, five-month period. Yeah. So um, he got on that first, did everything he could have possibly done, and proved that he's not taking anything. This I still, didn't this, see – so I saw the announcement of Matt's yeah. thing. I never actually saw the results. Did he get bigger yeah, so, and leaner and stronger? And Well, the results, I think, because it, it was all messed up because he tore his Achilles like before, before the testing started, playing football. So his, I don't know what he was trying to prove that he could still maintain his lifts or something. Mm. So I think he was able to bring it back, but he was getting tested throughout and there was no funky stuff happening. Okay. But it was interesting because he's making these videos and proving that he's natural. And then there's still people who are like, no, I don't believe you. They're not happy. So why did you, if that's the case, why would you message Derek? If Matt's gone through the most rigorous testing protocol available to man, and that's still not sufficient for some because, people. Because I think there's there's literally nothing more you can do. And if anybody is going to oversee any kind of testing, I would want Derek to do it. Because I'd... Derek, use, pick up the phone. I know. I'll ring him. I'll ring him once we're finished up. I was texting him this morning. I've, I've got the, the email and the WhatsApp. Wow. But I, I'm not going to pester him. To, to give I imagine, him... Imagine how busy he is To now. give him his due, that man is drowning in emails 24-7. Yeah. There was a period of... I'll ask him if I can put this into the podcast. I'm sure you won't have a problem with it, but we can cut it if, if needs be. Uh, after he released the Liver King video, which was, you know, this big crescendo, and then he does Rogan, then he does me, yeah, then he does yeah. Zach. I uh, watched them all. Then he does uh, like a comedy podcast, and then he maybe does one more. And he was like, dude, I'm, I have six months of unanswered emails to deal with because all he'd been doing was grinding, creating content, and then built up to this kind of big crescendo maximum thing. Mm. And then all he's like, what's he released? Like three videos maybe since November, December time, because he's super busy. This is one of the things that, I don't know, people don't really see the pain that goes into creating content like that. Or even for you, it's so effortful to make a fucking vlog. Yeah, the vlogs are long. 
dude, it is so painful. And it looks like a, a, a beautiful life. The number one uh, desired job amongst American children is influencer yeah. now. And I would imagine that, you know, YouTuber would probably get folded into that. There are some amazing parts of the job, but there are some bits that absolutely suck. If mm-hmm. you're sat with your editor the night before it needs to be uploaded, looking at the edit, unhappy with something, giving him amends on frame.io or whatever it is that you're using. Yeah. It's not that much fun. And I think that what you're seeing with Derek is, you know, the fall off on the well, other it's, side. It's the same with me. I used to have this really strict schedule where I would have to post at a certain time on a certain day. Yeah. And I would literally be pulling my hair out just to make sure that everything was perfect. Everything was filmed. And when I wasn't, you know, maybe two hours were left before the upload and it wasn't ready, I would be so stressed out. Yeah. And then I just thought it's not even worth it. I was just like, remove the schedule I was just and like, post if it's, as if, and when. I'll, it's post it when it's ready. Yeah. Post it a day later, two days later. What do you think, this is an interesting thing, especially given that you've been in the YouTube scene for a very long time, since before, I think before Derek was on YouTube, although he has been on for a long time talking about non-fitness mm. content. Do you think that he has been one of the bigger biggest influences in kind of shaping fitness YouTube over the last few years? What do you think has sort of improved or changed? I think so in in terms of education, definitely. Because he's he's like a frigging encyclopedia. He knows so much. So he's definitely, he's definitely had a positive impact. I don't know anyone else who's, I think there's a few other people now who are pretty clued up when it comes to. Jeff Nippard maybe? Yes, he puts a hell of a lot of work into his videos. Yeah. There's another guy, he puts the, I forgot his name, he puts all these um, like uh, re, uh, bands on his muscles. Okay. So it can pick up the twitching of the fibers. And he does all these exercises. Oh, Ryan, and it's Ryan, Ryan something. Okay, what, and, he, and that will determine how much yeah, so uh, he, muscle activation there yeah, is? Yeah, yeah, Mu- muscle activation doing different exercises. I've never seen it before. And I watched a few of his videos and he's, ve- he's very uh, charismatic mar- 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 and entertaining. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, I so what would you the, the trend when you started YouTube, or, you know, when I I, I think I was I was lucky because I was early. Yes, I would agree. You know, that Rob Lipset, like Harrison mm. Twins kind of era-ish. Mm-hmm. I think was a you know, it was a golden era for like bro content, vlogs, lifestyle, lifting. Mm. To me now, and I'm outside of that uh whatever like cohort of delivery on YouTube in any case. But for me, it it really feels like the um, evidence based, you know, sort of more yeah. scientific approach to education. I'm sure that there still are big lifestyle channels out there, but like I don't see your, your Jeff Sides of the world, your David Lades of the world. Mm. Like they don't that that style seems to have dropped away, and even your stuff seems to be leaning increasingly towards education, yeah. even outside of fitness. Is that? A but I, I feel like. That is what YouTube is becoming. It's becoming more of a platform for education. Like you said, there is there there is always going to be room for those uh, vloggers and lifestyle people like Jesse James. He's smashing it at the He's moment. He's absolutely fucking destroying but it. Yeah, there's only very few people who can do that. And maybe this, I feel like it's it's one of those things where people have seen everything. True. It's hard to reinvent be unique. Something. Yeah. So Zach, my housemate, was at the Arnold Classic a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Jesse James was there with an army of security guys. I, don't, I he didn't know what he was dressed up as. He was dressed up as something. He had a big suit on. He had a big beard on. Maybe he was being Chris Bumsteady, and I don't know. Oh. He's like he was being something. And uh, Zach said, watching it from the outside is fucking insane. Yeah. Like because it's just this gr- reality distortion field moving through uh, a crowd. He, of people. he is. He is one of the best. I've seen. He came to Dubai. Yes, he did a and video. I, I, yeah. You featured in a video, I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I just watched him work and I was like, wow. Like, everything he's got, he thoroughly deserves. However, he's not going to be able to keep that up. Why? Because he'll burn out. He's, he's young. I think he's like 23, 24. So, okay. you know, when you're that Made mean, of rubber and magic. You've got that energy. Do you remember being 23 it. or 24? Yeah. It was <laughs> fucking full of energy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm noticing now. I'm like, I'm going to be 33 this year and I'm noticing like, fuck, I'm tired. <laughs> and the worst thing is, like Hormozzi said it, it's like, this is the most energetic you are going to be. It's downhill it's from here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, you're sick. Yeah. Well, Jesse's, Jesse's a very interesting one, I think, because it's the skit style of video without the cringe and mm-hmm. the cheese. The one There was one that he did with Ronnie Coleman and Jay Cutler 
that I, to me pushed the limit on the upper bound. I was like, if this goes much more, it's going to be a little yeah. bit like, oh. Uh, but the one that he did where he pretended to be Chris Bumstead, for the people that don't know who we're talking about, Jesse James, fitness YouTuber, um, very charismatic guy, young dude from America. And he does... He's got two and a half million subs now, I think. And he hasn't been going that long. No. And he's absolutely he's, flying. Yeah. But that's that's the, you know, it's evident that he's got, I don't know whether he's formally... No, he, he is, well, first of all, he is a big ball of energy. Yep. Insane amount of energy. I think very extroverted. Yep. He has absolutely no fear going up to people, which was very interesting to watch as well. And he's just, he's just a hard worker, always working. Like but you can tell you, there's always a million things going on in his head. You'd be concerned about his ability to keep up that work rate. Yeah. I don't think, because it, like, it just gets to a point, I think with, unless you really, really, really love something, most of the time you're kind of like, oh, this is getting a bit repetitive now. Like it's not necessarily sustainable. Is his work rate effortful? I haven't, I, I've, yeah. Zach said it looks like a, a massive re reality distortion field moving through a, an expo, but it's it just, a lot of it's, work. It's like flying around, constantly planning, constantly just being in front of the camera. Like I can only imagine how many, how much actually doesn't even get put into the video. Like mm -hmm. you only see the best of the best. You don't see like all the, the outtakes. Well, that's another reason why the vlog format is just so impractical yeah. right you know you yeah. want to film a vlog about your i remember you you did uh some stuff about you got a, a nice new car and you wanted like to let people know about the car that you'd got mm. it took like two days <laughs> yeah, yeah we a, had to, a 16 minute yeah, fucking video lose here. we had to drive all the way to the desert which was like an hour away then we had to drive up and down this track with another car filming so we're probably filming that little 20 second edit for like an hour yep and then I remember that's a podcast. You would yeah, have had a podcast. Know, done I, that and then time. I remember driving somewhere else just to do like a talking part, which I kept fucking up. And then I was just like, "Wow, this is two or three days' work." Yeah. And now I'm noticing it's like it's not practical. I do like the vlogs, and I still think it's a big part of my channel. Mm. But I think now I only want to make a vlog if something really cool is happening. Mm. Either I'm meeting up with someone very interesting, or I'm going somewhere really cool. The travel vlogs are wicked because it's like documenting myself going on holiday. Yes. And then I'm also sharing the place with people. I did a, the reason I'm here in Dubai is because I just did a debate in Qatar. I saw about, that. Uh, is masculinity under attack? And um, it's the first time that I've done anything remotely close to TV uh, for quite a long time. You know, I got familiar with it, with the dating stuff, mm -hmm. Take Me Out, Love Island, and then other bits of produced documentaries. But especially after having spent so much time doing this, where if you forget, you forgot the guy's name that puts the thing around his arm. Mm. If that happens on TV, that's a cut, right? Let's research it, shout it out, uh, and then we'll run it again from the top. Can you just say, Mike, just run that again for us, please? It's like, whereas that's if- That's weird. So there's no flow. It's like No, no, no not at all. No, of course not. Because they, they, they've got 45 minutes. They've got ad breaks to go in between all the rest of the stuff. Are they trying to sell it to Netflix? Are they trying to do whatever? And the thing that we did was like incredibly well produced, massive team, two, 100, 150 people on site to do this thing. Unbelievable production. But even with that, you know, there's, there's things that the host that was mediating the debate needs to do. And for me, it just feels, uh, experientially so much more like stop starty you know we the guy that i was debating me and him weren't supposed to speak to each other before like when we were backstage whereas if even if you were sitting down to have a conversation with someone that you disagreed with you'd welcome them at the door give them a glass of water say oh right, okay blah blah, mm -hmm. blah 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 three two one welcome to the show and you just crack on um that's why i don't like tv anymore it seems so fake and staged seem real it's so trite to say like every you know rogan and all of those guys have been going going on about it for ages but look at what jesse james does right mm. his content is heavily staged but it's done in a way that almost draws you in yeah right it's quite likable it's quite enjoyable and yeah I, i'm just fascinated um about what's happened with especially like the vlogging world, I think the rise of podcasts has trickled down, you know, you being able to do Q and A's, you being able to do direct to camera things. Mm -hmm. But if someone was starting up a channel now, we were talking about this earlier on, what advice would you say? Someone's listening and they go, I fancy making a YouTube channel. I'm prepared to sell my soul to the devil. I have absolutely, I'll go as low as I need to. I'll play any role that I need to. How would you from first principles just say, this is how to get to a million subs as quickly as possible if you're prepared to sell your soul? Yeah, if you wanted to with the 
absolute minimal work required, you can just pick up other people's content, viral content, and just react to it and have some sort of animated reaction, which will provide people some form of entertainment. And you're just kind of piggybacking off other people's amazing work, which is kind of like quite questionable. But if you want to grow very quickly, that's one way to do it. Another way, it depends how how knowledgeable you are as a person. Like if you have a, not a lot of knowledge to spread and you're very good at communicating and can present yourself well, all you have to do is just sit down and talk. Make it, you know, a little bit entertaining. Have an editor put some cool edits on it and then you can just bang out videos nonstop. That makes it sound very easy. Yeah, I guess it's a little, a little bit harder than that. But it is, in a way, it's... I'm trying to work out, you know, given the fact that I, th- I think that you're not far off. I don't disagree. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just trying to work out where it is that people get stuck. They don't have a skill set. They don't have any value to offer, I think. Oh, so they don't have any expertise yeah. that they can actually talk on. Yeah, well, I mean, I was having a discussion with a friend about this today about um, Aubrey Marcus, CEO of Onnit, founder of Onnit, now sold it, um, told me this thing a few years ago. He said that you don't serve people from your cup. You serve them from the source that overflows around your cup. And he's saying it in classic Austin psychedelic Mm -hmm. fashion right but what he actually means is sort your shit first right you need to make sure that you are sufficiently capable to do the you thing Mm -hmm. before you then try and proselytize to the world about how they should be doing it or how you did it and they can do it how you did it and stuff which is why i think if you look at almost all of the podcasts that are doing very well you know you're talking like rogan 50s huberman 40s like Tim Dillon, 30s, mm. Chris D'Elia, late 30s, 40s, like all of these, you know, whether it's comedy, whether it's whatever, pick pick your big name mm. podcast, Tim Ferriss, 40s, like these guys are older. Well, hang on, if you go to other social media, they're not the ones that crush on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, unless it's repurposing content yeah, yeah. from a different platform. And I think that the reason for that is, and it's a very good change. We can like complain about, and I do, I'm like rail against TikTok and short form and it's killing people's brains and blah, blah. But certainly one of the good things is that people who have genuine expertise and who don't have been thrown into harsh light by long form conversations. Yeah. Because if That's you a good s- thing. sit someone down yeah. for an hour and a half and you go, oh, there's nothing there. Mm-hmm. There's absolutely nothing there. There's nowhere to hide in these yeah. conversations. Yeah. And I think the older you get, the wiser you are and the more life experience you have. It's quite hard for you to sit there and listen to a 22-year-old tell you how you should live your life, particularly if you're like over 30, even though they might actually know how to live life better than you do. Guys, a lot of guys are just, they'll be too stubborn. They'll be like, nah, I'd rather listen to someone who's the same age as me or a little bit older. And it's one of the reasons why I held off from this podcast for a bit. Because I remember when we did ours, I was like, man, like that was amazing. Like, I think I want to do my own. And then I was like, Nah, not yet. I haven't got the expertise, which is crazy, right? For people to look at. Uh, I think I just needed, I needed two more years of living life. Mm-hmm. And I certainly did that. What's your views on why men are feeling sort of quite lost at the moment? Because me and you went to uni at basically the same time. I think we're one or two years mm-hmm. age difference. We did the same course at Newcastle. We trained at the Center for Sporting Excellence, mm-hmm. right? The CSE together, which would have been your first major like consistent gym, I'm yeah, going to guess. Yeah, yeah, that's when I would do my bro split for the first time. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> um, so we would have been walking through Richardson Road, Halls of Residence in, where did you live? Where were you in first year? Castle Leases. Wait, you posh twat. No, yeah, but this is the thing. I didn't know. I didn't, I don't know why I picked it, but I picked it. And then I realized I was like the only northerner there. Correct. Yeah. So for the, people that, for the people that don't know, Newcastle University, northeast of the UK. Should have been in Richardson Road. Should have been in Rick, Ricky Road. Um, I was in St. Mary's in Fenham because I put it as my insurance mm. and they make you pay. Uh, you were in with all of the posh boys. Yeah. My point being, when we went to university, when we were the age of a lot of the guys that are seeking advice online at the moment. There was, there was nothing online. But I don't think that there was a sense of being lost, mm. despite the fact that there was less information out there. Mm-hmm. I don't think that, and, and that's not to say that me and you tumbled into some like perfect slick archetype of being, mm. of finding our place within university or whatever. Mm-hmm. I think both of us in like, certain ways were a little bit disjointed and took time to find our feet. Yeah. I'd, <sighs> what do you think's changed? Why is it that guys are... I think it's maybe the comparison aspect of it because 
I definitely didn't have a clue what I was doing. And I think it was only until I was 23, yeah, 23 when I became a personal trainer, I was like, okay, so this is probably a step in the right direction. Before that, I was working as a manager in Hollister, worked the club, pro club promoter for a bit, doing all sorts. But I never felt lost. I was just like, okay, well, yeah, I'll just, I'll just do this. But I, I had no one else to compare myself to. Like, I wasn't comparing myself to any other 22 or 23 year old out there in fact i thought i was doing pretty good because i was like hey i've come out of university and i've got a job whereas now you got people who are like 16 20 21 22 who are just making a killing and i think because they're so out there on social media and they have gained quite a lot of following because of the success they've had i think a lot of guys maybe that age or even a little bit older they're like hang on how has this guy managed to make so much money and so successful? And I am literally doing nothing with my life. Comparatively, even yeah. if you are on a graduate scheme at Hollister. Yeah. I think that's one thing. And then maybe the value of a degree has massively gone downhill now. I don't think people are thinking, oh, should I go to university anymore? Is it worth it? Like, do I need to go? Do I not need to go? Like, what should I spend my time learning? I think it can be quite confusing out there. All of my richest friends don't use their degrees. Yeah. I don't use my degree. Don't you don't. Know. George, the guy that I was at at his house before, unbelievably successful marketing business, mm. did philosophy at uni. Can't remember any of it. Like, I, I think that all of that's very correct. There's a, a quote that says, comparison is the thief of joy. Yeah. And maybe that, maybe that contributes to a big part of it, the fact that just your ability to see 0.001% success absolute outliers crushing at a younger age than you uh so i went to the ufc's power slap event oh. in vegas last saturday which was fucking wild and i saw aiden ross one of the biggest streamers in the world mm. i saw all of the nelk boys kyle uh mike from uh impulsive haspelar was there dan bilzerian was there like just bing 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 like tick pick your mm. steve will do it like everybody right all of the the biggest guys that would have been around that that sort of community and you look i mean aiden ross i think he's maybe 20 20 21 mm. he's one of the biggest streamers in the world um like i show speed is something similar maybe even younger maybe he's 19 uh kyle and all of the nelk boys are maybe getting toward their mid 20s mid late 20s but they've got like businesses and yeah. franchises and clothing companies and all this stuff i guess a lot of guys are just thinking oh well maybe i need to take the influencer route and that's why they're so confused yeah perhaps and what about is there something else going on about some about men's roles do you think like young guys roles in in the world is something being lost there i guess so i mean i'm not massively clear on what it was to begin with what what, what there used to be young men's roles? I don't, well, this is the point. When me and mm. you were at uni, I was also useless. Mm. I, I had no idea. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. But it, there didn't feel like a pressure to know what I was supposed to do. Mm. So e e every generation looks back at the generation coming after them and can't believe how quickly they're growing up. Yeah, I'm pretty glad I'm not a part of this younger generation. I feel like we had it pretty sweet. Why? It just felt like a simpler time. Growing up, First of all, without social media, I think maybe when I get onto Facebook, that was probably when I was at university, just before university. You needed 17. a uni email address when we yeah. went. So it was nice just to have my teen, teenage years without all the social media. We just even weren't on phones. Wasn't I even BBM, I had, I had like was a Nokia. A, yeah, I had like a Sony Ericsson, a Nokia. I, just, I feel like I spent a lot more time being present and then um, yeah, the world's a bit mad now. Like really mad with all the woke stuff and I don't know. Well, one of the problems that you have is everybody always presumes that giving more freedom to people will allow them to more accurately choose the precise thing that they want, mm -hmm. right? If, you, if there's one pair of jeans in the store and you go in, then maybe you wanted a different pair and you only get that one. If there's a thousand pairs of jeans in the store, fantastic. You can optimize your choice precisely for the exact type of jeans, the cut, the color, the length, the stretch, the whatever, right? Weighs everything. Mm. The problem is that takes the decision 
of or the uh, outcome of success or failure out of the hands of your limited choices and more into your hands. You know, you see how this would be an issue, mm. right? If you choose an ever so slightly suboptimal pair of jeans, that's your fault because there was an optimal pair of jeans for you to take. And I think that the same thing happens here that if the rules and guidelines um, that people previously would have followed have perhaps been removed a little bit, and if expectations have been raised, you should be doing more at this age, you're able to compare yourself, so on and so forth. That's a really perfect blend mm. of um, internal uncertainty and external pressure that can cause someone to think, holy fuck, like, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I don't know all of the things previously, the traits that I would have taken pride in, the uh, you know, the protector, provider, competent, courageous, brave, stands up well under pressure, doesn't give up easily, emotionally mature, all of those things that specifically men would have relied on. That's only one step away from toxic masculinity, yeah. right? All of those can very easily be well, protecting. Why is it that you think that women need to be protected? Should it not be the case that women can be safe without the protection of men? What is it that you're intending on doing with them? Oh, provider, you think that women can't afford to look after themselves? You want women back in the kitchen, do you? You don't want them to have careers. You're like, holy fuck, like, can we not turn the volume of this conversation down? Yeah, because you must have had a lot of these conversations with the interviews you've done. Do you, find, do you think it's uh, the dating market at the moment is the worst it's ever been? It's a really good question. Um, I certainly think that it's the most confusing and the outcomes seem to have the highest rates of sexlessness that we've ever seen. Hmm. So 30% of men-ish, around about a third of men, haven't had sex in the last year, aged 18 to 30. This stat that just came out from Pew a couple of weeks ago, 50% of men say that they're pursuing a relationship short-term or long-term, which means that 50% of men aren't aged 18 to 30. Now, both me and you and everybody that's listening that has a penis who's been through the ages of 18 to 30 knows what the male sex drive feels like oh. at that age. Can you imagine what it, what the world has to be like and what your experience of life has to be like for your sex drive to be chopped in half, essentially, right? It'll drive you mad. Yeah, but, but these guys are self-identifying as saying, I'm not bothered about a short-term or a long-term relationship. Like, for you to get yourself to the stage where you've tamped down on that sex drive, and there's talk of, like, reducing levels of testosterone, phthalates in the water, increasing levels of estrogen in everything that we eat, less time outside, blah, blah, blah. Like, people know that. Uh, testosterone's dropped 1% a year since 1980. Um, so that may contribute to it too. But in 2019, it was 61% of guys were short-term and long-term, looking for the short-term, long-term mating thing. And that's dropped 11% in four years. It's like, rapid decline. So I certainly do think that... But what the are these guys doing? Are they just focusing on their own shit? That's a really like, good question. they just not... That's a really good question. I don't know. I think that a lot of guys are retreating from all the going, real world. All going monk mode now. But uh, <laughs> if they were, if it was proper monk mode, where it's, I'm working on my self-development, I'm building myself up, I'm, that would indicate that they're taking a break to then come back mm -hmm. in, to integrate into both society and dating. But I think that a lot of these guys are just fully checked out. Even at younger ages, you know, like under 20, like guys that are under 20 going, men going their own way. It's like, dude, like you haven't had chance to not go your own way. I'm trying to think if I was 18 year old, if I was 18 now, it would be a lot harder compared to when I was 18. Harder you know, to like, do what? I don't know, just date. I think now because of social media, it's obviously way more competitive. And I just think a lot of women who are, let's say if I was 18, they're 18. They're probably not going to be looking for an 18 year old to date. They'll be looking for older guys to date. Mm. But I feel like that wasn't as much of a thing back then. Absolutely not. No, the, the amount of people that you had access to would have been limited. Mm. But the, the, you know, coming out the back of this conversation I had uh, yesterday, at this debate in Doha, it was all about masculinity, masculinity being under attack. And I think that this is a concern for women as well, like a massive concern. So I found, I found this really, really like, interesting story about the uh, Batman Dark Knight Rises uh, movie premiere so it's 2012 in Aurora, Colorado, and there was a, a shooting that happened there. The shooter was a lone man. I think he was 27 years old. So he enters the movie theater, and he starts unloading rounds just kind of at will. And three men, 24, 26, and 27, threw themselves on top of their girlfriends to use their bodies as shields. All three men died. All three women survived. Mm-hmm. 
if that is the kind of masculinity that you want to get rid of in the modern world, if that's the one that is toxic and a part of a oppressive patriarchal superstructure that's misogynistically keeping everybody down and you want to get rid of that, we don't live on the same planet. Mm. Like there is no world in which that is the sort of benevolent force for good where somebody sacrifices themselves for someone that they love that you want to get rid of. Like, how can you tell me that that's something yeah. that's a good way that, that we should get rid of that inbuilt uh, uh, desire to protect? And here's the thing. You could say that it's chivalry or it's uh, cultured or it's societally programmed. You're telling me that these guys, after bullets are flying, have thought to themselves, hmm, like what's the like uh, proper thing to do in what would society want me to do? And from first principles, they've created a world where they go, oh, yes, I should throw myself on top. No, it's a, an instinct that's deeper and more more inbuilt than that. And I'm just, I'm really genuinely becoming concerned about this retreat from society that men are suffering with. And I couldn't agree more, man. Like, I'm. Do you think men are, uh, the, they're fighting back a bit now. Thanks to Andrew Tate, there's more people bringing out more masculine content, standing up for masculinity. Yeah, so I think the best... Maybe not in the mainstream media, but I feel like on social media, there's more of it. I would agree. Uh, I certainly think that Tate's got an exaggerated view of masculinity. And mm. I think that Shapiro hits the nail on the head, which is that Tate is almost always right about the diagnosis but significantly less right about the prescription to fix it. Mm. That he is able to point out the problems, but his solutions much of the time aren't going to be quite as effective. Yeah, I think the delivery needed work as well. Yeah. So there's a, a concept I've come up with called the soft signal of effectiveness. And what this means is that um, if you are having a discussion with somebody that disagrees with you or that maybe just hasn't made their mind up, you have to realize if you make them feel silly or foolish or ridiculous that they're going to dig their heels into their position you don't nobody has ever been patronized or ridiculed into changing their mind because it just creates this defense to happen and this is why like i'm nowhere near red pilled enough for most of the manosphere but i'm significantly far too red pilled for almost all of the people that are on the more wokey side of things um but i genuinely believe that that's the most effective way to change minds like if you make people still feel silly, they're going to dig their heels in. And mm. I think that that's one of the challenges that, that Andrew comes up against. Now, it garners an awful lot of views, which is great, and it, it is good for getting a message out there. But in terms of changing behavior effectively, I'm not too sure. But obviously, yeah. you you had – how many plays is that video? That's that you, <laughs> nearly like six million views. Now. Is that your most played video? No, it'll be like this. I think it's like the third most played. Right. It but it's like climbing up to the top. Though. Yeah, and you did that yeah. kind of a little bit before his super yeah, yeah. explosion. So talk me through, you know, we've been talking so far about the challenges that men face in the modern world, mm -hmm. problems of masculinity. You've spent a good bit of time with Tate. What were your thoughts after having spent time with him? How do you think he's contributing to the conversation on masculinity? Where is he failing and falling short? I think the problem was all the short form content that was getting put out there. Obviously it was just like the most extreme out of context clips, mostly from some of his old videos. So when he, when he started off, he's been doing content for a long time. His older videos are just wild. Like he's just saying some mad shit, but he can do because nobody's even watching. Right. So there's, when not many people are watching your videos, you can get away with saying a lot more. As he became drastically popular, obviously people were going back to the old videos and were like, what the hell? They were using that content and it was just going crazy. I, when I first came across him, he actually DM'd me. This, this was in 2021. And um, I went on his Instagram and I went to a few pictures and I just thought, who is this guy? Like, it seemed like he was um, trying to show off a little bit too much. And I thought it was all just a front. You know how a lot of people out here are just fake. They're Rent, just trying renting to rent, cars. renting cars, yep. trying to show, hey, I've got money. That's what I thought when I saw him. I was like, this guy's just chatting shit. But then I did a little bit of research and I listened to some of the podcasts. I think the first one he went on that I listened to was Fresh and Fit. And then that was the first time I, I, I'd actually listened to someone. I was like, whoa, like this guy, this guy is speaking 
in a way that I've never heard anyone speak before. And he's saying things which I haven't really heard anyone say before. So I was intrigued and I wanted to listen to more. And then I was like, actually, do you know what? I want to meet this guy. So we came to Dubai. We linked up. We did the videos. We just after. Did he come up especially to see you? I think, he, I mean, he's always, he's always do, doing business wherever he goes. But I guess maybe that was part of the plan at that point. He just wanted to, because he saw, he must have seen me. Probably thought, oh yeah, Mike seems like a cool guy. But he saw the audience. How wrong he was. And, he was, and, <laughs> <laughs> and then he probably thinks, you know what? Like he was obviously on a mission to Grow. get more followers so he can yep. push whatever he needs to push. So he, he probably would have seen me. Okay, yeah, I'll do a video of Mike and then that can help me out with my branding and exposure. Obviously that works very well. But um, yeah, I met him in real life and he's he's actually an even better guy. Oh no, a lot of people don't like him, but he in real life, he's like a nice guy, polite. He's actually funny. And um, I think that's a side which a lot of people don't see because they, he definitely just put on some kind of a character, especially in the videos which he makes himself. And he says things and I'm just like, oh, like why do you say that? It's like 70% of the stuff he says, he's like, yeah, like I strongly agree with that. And then he will go and say something absolutely ridiculous. And it's just like, why did you need to say that? Because that's the 30% that people are going to focus on. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, again, this didn't quite come up yesterday. It came up with uh, Jordan Peterson as the example. But I said something to the effect of, um, if you're not happy with the role models that are currently being held up for men, offer up other ones. Mm. And I asked the guy that was across from me, the debater, who do you think is a good role model for men? And he struggled a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, he struggled a lot, actually. It's hard to find someone who's the full package, I think. Correct. But I was, I was able to say, well, look, like it's not perfect, but I would say that the kind of man that Peterson would tell you to be, your mm -hmm. Andrew Huberman's of the world, your Tim Ferriss's of the world, your Joe Rogan's of the world, your Jocker Willink's, like these are people that seem to have codes of honor and ethics. They do hard things. They're courageous and brave. Like, you know. They don't get into drama. They don't get into drama. <laughs> I should have just said Mike Thurston. Um, but I. It's, it's weird that more people don't want, it, more men don't want to be like those guys. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe they do. Maybe they do. It's just that they're not selling that kind of sexy. Yeah. out there lifestyle because it doesn't necessarily resonate like it's hard it's it's hard difficult nuanced suffering things mm -hmm. i mean whole mosey man i was spent i spent uh saturday with him last week in in vegas podcasted trained and i uh, went to the power slap launch thing with him and the guy's an unbelievably slick operator. He's one of the most impressive yeah, people. I've, I've really with. been getting into his content. He's a recently. terrifyingly competent human, right? Mm. But I don't even know if he owns a car. Oh, he just he owns. He, they've, they've maybe have like a, a car, but it's like a Tes like a nice Tesla, mm. right? The guy sold his business for a hundred mil. Yeah. He's now doing acquisition deals for fucking lots and lots of money. So the and this kind of maybe explains a little bit of of the Tate phenomenon, which was that his delivery was so compelling because say what you want about what he says, the way that he says it is incredibly interesting. And it's very, very, very compelling, very precise speaker, good with his words. You know, to go head to head with Piers Morgan, Piers Morgan is as hard nosed as you're going to get. Very, very good in a, a cantankerous debate. And he charmed Piers Morgan twice and beat him at chess. Right? He's a very competent guy. He gets like, I'll be honest, when I, this was last summer, I was listening to a lot of his podcasts and he was getting me fired up to work. The stuff he says about women, I just, I usually will just ignore. But when he talks about just doing the job, regardless of how you feel, just get the job done, wake up early, go to the gym. And the fact that there's just so many other people out there that are your potential competitors. Mm. If you don't get out there and put the work in, then they're going to, overtake you but remember that that is david goggins and jocko willink's message yeah. to a t with different delivery and with yeah. a different package that it's being folded into yeah. so yeah i think and this was the point that i made if you leave a vacuum for role models and i think the same is coming for women you know for the girls that have been uh left out of this conversation so far i think that there is a burbling below the surface i think that there is a concern a big concern for role models for girls as well yeah this is this is a this is a problem because I'm actually trying to find some really good female role models for the podcast. And it's 
quite hard to do that out here. Yeah, I wonder because we were talking about this before. I I, I don't know because there, there is a lot of successful smart women but they don't want to raise their voice. They don't want to be on the camera. They don't Why wanna, do you think that is? I don't know. This is what I'm trying to figure out. You've you've reached out to them and suggested I've, re- I've reached out to a few. I have I have friends um got a big following, very smart, very intelligent and they're just like don't they're avoiding it. it and I'm like I am literally giving you an opportunity to be the voice of women yep. and to be a role model to all the women out there mm. that they need. Why why are you not doing it? That's very interesting. So I let me put my evolutionary psychologist hat on for a second. Um I, I would say first of all, maybe it's the uh they're probably a lot more bothered about how they look on camera. So they would probably want everything to be perfect. Mm-hmm. And women have bad days and they're like, oh, my hair's messed up today, so maybe I'm not going to film. Or like, oh, I don't like the angle the camera is facing on my face. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it takes a very particular type of woman to decide to put herself out there as a spokesperson. Um, So this evolutionary psychology bias that it seems that women have, they, they try and flatten hierarchies. So a bunch of studies show that if females, especially girls in school, know that their grades are going to be made public. They're going to downplay what they got. So if guys get an A, if me and you were in uni and we mm-hmm. walked out of some accounting exam in the CSE or like Henderson Hall or wherever the, our exam mm-hmm. was, we would walk outside or let's say that we got, it was a multiple choice and we got the results there and then, and I got an A and you got a B, I'd stick it in your face. Yeah. But the evidence suggests that girls will very much try and downplay that. Another That's really like body count as well. Um, <laughs> perhaps I don't think those two things are actually linked, but yeah, perhaps. Um, but the reason that it seems to be the case with that is that um, jealousy is a massive risk to women. They're very competitive with each other, but they're competitive in a much more subtle and nuanced way. They don't get. They're not competitive uh, outwardly, yeah, right? In, yeah. They're competitive in a, a much more, uh, it's m- more complex and you could maybe say more devious. They're certainly much more complex social yeah, beings, yeah. women's. It, it makes sense. I feel like what, I, what I've noticed recently is, especially out here, at least with the guys, I feel like all the guys are out here supporting each other and helping each other level, level up. But the women are like, they're out to, they want to be the best. They, I mean, it's, and they're not helping each other, dude. It's it's really this is the thing. And guys can say women have got it easy; they're outperforming us in education and employment, and blah blah blah. Women are having a really fucking rough time of it. Like no one is no one is flourishing at the moment. There's maybe some guys at the top and some girls at the absolute top that are having a great time of it on average at the moment. That's not to say that individuals can't have like an enjoyable life, mm. but like it's really tough for girls at the moment. Okay, so. There is this ever dwindling pool of guys that are eligible for you. You have more opportunities than ever before. Society says that you shouldn't become a mother. You maybe want to have a career, but also like to have the idea to have a family. But if you have a family, you treated like a second class citizen that's being conned by the patriarchy into becoming a domestic prostitute. Like it's really not, yeah. it's really, really complex if, for them to. If I was a woman, I, I, I really wouldn't know what to do. No, no, me neither. And given the fact that we spent the first half of this conversation talking about how difficult it is for men. And I think that, it's maybe it's at least equal in terms of how lost the roles are Mm -hmm. for women going forward. The one difference, and I think that this is quite a big difference and quite an important one is that men are still having the finger pointed at them and being told that they're the architects of their own misery and also the architects of everybody else's as well. Like if there's ever a problem with any group, usually we would say, okay, what's going on? How can we try and change the world or society so that we can help this group flourish, right? There's not enough women going to university in 1970. So we introduced title nine for affirmative action and it encourages women to go. Now the gender split between men and women is 15% instead of 13% when it was in 1970, but in the other direction. Mm. So there are fewer men going to university than there were fewer women going to university when that title was introduced and now it's like, well, why, why are men falling behind? Can't they pull themselves up by their bootstraps? So that is the one of the differences and one of the support structures that women do have that I think is lacking more so for men, uh, which is the uh, sympathy that the wider world would typically give them. And it's because, you know, like 
men, specifically white men, have had it good for so long that maybe it's their turn to, you know, be on the receiving end of some disadvantages for a while, which is not how the world is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be that you're like overdrawn on your suffering balance and now it's your turn to to take some of this. I don't think that that's the way that it's supposed to work. But yeah, I I really I really think that we're going to see over the next few years like a challenge for women for their role models. What am I supposed to do with my life? How can I find like pride uh, and fulfillment that doesn't completely destroy like my innate biological urges as well? What's your experience been trying to find female guests for your hmm. show? Easier for me uh, because my interest in psychology, a uh, uh, area which is uh. dominated by women, has meant that at least 50% of the episodes that I do are with women. Mm -hmm. But this is an interesting lesson to learn. There was a period a while ago where I was big into the productivity space. I was doing a lot of stuff around health and fitness. It's a, both arenas that are dominated by men. And I would get criticized for the fact that I was bringing too many men on. Like, why, why aren't there enough men? Uh, why, aren't there enough, yeah, I was well. why aren't there enough women? Uh, but then since women come on, people just find something else to criticize. It's like, well, could you <laughs> why is everybody from, why is everybody right leaning? Or why is everybody British? Or why is everybody white? Like you're never going to be able to make your guest list sufficiently pure or uh, sufficiently representative mm. to mediate all of people's problems. And the way that you said before we started, I was like, who, why are you bringing your guests on? And you said, anybody that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that you can go. It's yeah. the only way that you, you can can't go. fake the interest. No, correct. Uh, something else that's changed with you recently, which I've been very, very enjoying watching happen. I'm wearing more clothes on my Instagram pictures. That's been nice <laughs> for me personally as well. Yes. Don't lie. But your relationship with alcohol. Oh, yeah. Talk to me about your relationship with alcohol and how it's changed. Yeah. So I, um, I pretty much barely drink anymore. Um, I used to be, I guess that's because of the whole British culture. I used to drink numerous times per week, particularly when I was growing up university, then even throughout my 20s. I was very much into my fitness, but at the same time, there was always at least one extremely heavy blowout at the weekend. And then um, it just carried on. Like even, I think when I was, when I was th the, just before, no, 29, I did the first experiment where I went sober for six months. And that taught me a lot because I was put in situations where I would normally drink. And because I was doing this challenge, I wasn't allowed to drink. And I think that was the first time that I was in situations where uh, usually I would be drunk and like in a relaxed state, whatever it might be. But this time, like I was sober. I was doing something which I would never do. And I actually realized it wasn't that hard to do. And I actually quite liked it. And I think I just, life is just short and I can't afford to have days wasting away feeling sorry for myself, being ex aggressively hungover, which at the age I'm at now, it, the hangovers are they pretty aggressive. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But what, what I'll do now is I will, I will still drink, but it usually tends to be when I have done achieved something or I've got the job done and I can celebrate. It's like, okay, you've achieved this. Let's go out. Let's celebrate. Have a drink if you want to have a drink. Once that's over, then it's back to the grind again. What else have you learned from your time going sober? Obviously, the reason for doing it is that you don't want to waste um, your days so much, but what else have you learned? I actually really enjoy my reality being sober. Um. I actually don't really like the feeling of being drunk anymore. I think now I'm at a point where I feel like I'm very much in control. I like that. I really like the person who I am now when I'm sober. I can, I'm extremely more, a lot more confident now. I can have conversations with anyone. I can charm people. I can, you know, have a laugh. I can have a dance. I can do whatever I need to do, but I can do it sober. And there's actually no real need for me to drink. And when I do drink, I realize actually, I start to get a little bit sloppy with my words. I say things which I wouldn't normally say, might potentially regret. And then there's parts of the night, all conversation, which I won't remember. And then I wake up feeling like absolute trash. I spend a lot of money as well out here on alcohol, which is usually just not wise. So it's, uh, 
when I compare the positives to the negatives, there's actually very few positives. Yeah. So this, I mean, you know, this I, was something. I don't, I don't know. I'm thinking now, like, what, so why did I drink? That's the question so I had on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. Like, you've 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 laid out this balance sheet of positives mm. and negatives. Why did either of us? And this is both of our upbringings, right? You know, our formative years in Newcastle, and then both of us stuck about once we finished our degrees, going out, drinking trebs, you know. You can get absolutely annihilated for like 10 pounds. Correct. Yeah. So again, for the people that don't know, when we were at uni, you could have got three, three treble vodka for mixers for a fiver, and you would usually get a free Jaeger bomb with each of them. So that's nine shots of vodka plus three shots of Jaeger for a fiver. And the way that it would work, because you couldn't carry all of them back, yeah. you would have to pour all of the Jaegers in together, drink that, drink one of the Trebs, and then carry two back. Um, so what I'm thinking is, why is it that we ever saw it as something that not only we would do, we would willingly do, we would repeatedly do mm. two nights a week throughout all of uni? Why? I think... I, I, from thinking back when I was at university, I actually don't, re now that I recall, I don't know anybody that didn't drink. I feel like every single person drank. Yep. And if there was anyone that didn't drink, they were just, they were weird. You wouldn't hang out with them. But they weren't a part of the yeah. social group. Yeah, they weren't a part of the social circle. Um, I definitely remember drinking a lot just to feel more comfortable to reduce the anxiety. Me too. Um, yeah, because especially when you're having you're in uh, a club, the music's really loud, there's lights everywhere, there's people everywhere talking. It's really overwhelming. So the alcohol would numb that and then you would feel more comfortable. Just to interject there, think about the modern world, this 2023 version of the world. Someone would say that if that was a, a challenge that you were coming up against, that that's because you're like a blue pill beta simp guy who hasn't worked on his masculine essence and stuff and i think that just to bring it back to what we spoke about earlier on about like why young guys struggling specifically now this expectation again that you should have your shit together you go really i didn't yeah i didn't i absolutely drank so i had confidence to speak to girls i remember i used to have this i had this uh like pink polo shirt and pair of jeans and one night i pulled because like, and I was adamant that it was because of this particular outfit. And I'm like, oh, that's like, that's the one. And I was so drunk that I could barely remember what had happened during the night. Yeah. And you think, what, like, what, how? That's that's compensating for the fact that it's just a really highly stimulating, pretty anxiety-inducing environment. Mm -hmm. I think it it would probably make more sense just to not go out. But that was that was like the biggest part of university was going out, particularly Newcastle. Correct. That was like the reason why I choose I chose Newcastle. Also correct. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I guess at that age, the, you really don't have much responsibility. Like I think back to university. I mean, I just you obviously you needed to get the bare minimum done. You had to do a bit of studying. You didn't have a job. You just living off the student loan. Yep. Just having because you a could. laugh yep. with your mates. So if you did wake up hungover, then so what? Yeah. Didn't really spend the spend yeah. the day watching the rugby World Cup or whatever was going on the Six Nations mm. or some other thing or movies in the in the common room and then get back to it. Yeah, I am. Um, so I, I, again, I get that, but I think the number of people that drink, the number of young people that are choosing to go low and no alcohol lifestyles, massively increasing. Yeah, I'd love to say that this is downstream from a trend that I kicked off, but I think it's bigger than that, <laughs> and. I do. I, I. I can't work out what's going on there. I wonder whether. I think it's more. It's just accepted now. I think it was really not acceptable back in the day. Unacceptable to not drink. Yeah, like, unacceptable. Whereas now it's like okay, yeah, fair enough. Maybe the. I, I think there's a lot more informative content out there, which is showing just how bad alcohol is. Like humans and the his video about alcohol. Yeah. Listen to that, and you're like. Wow. Never want to drink again. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, it's really, really so bad. So I think more people are waking up to the negative side effects of drinking alcohol. Um, but it's still, there's still a lot of people drinking. I still have a lot of friends who are drinking. Yeah. But I just don't give a shit if I'm going to offend their feelings. I wonder whether 
part of it comes to choosing first off choosing the kind of events that you go to and mm. then secondly that that growing in confidence because you're right if you're in a banging loud student nightclub with 1500 sweaty freshers and the killer's mr brightside playing at ear bleeding oh, levels which is like beard like, spilt like, on your face correct you're that's not the place for you to what advantage do you have in being able to have a better conversation Mm-hmm. And that you almost need to drink to be able to cope with the environment that you're in to be able to make it good. And this is the thing that I've been saying for like seven years. Like if you need to drink in order to be able to enjoy a night out, you're choosing the wrong nights out. Mm-hmm. Like what you're saying is that the experience that you're going on is so bad that you have to anesthetize yourself. You have to numb yourself to the experience. You're what? Well, it's like saying, I, I'm, I'm going to go and do this push. I'm going to go stick needles through the skin on the back of my hand, but I'll take some painkillers so it doesn't hurt so much. Yeah. Hang, hang on a second. As you grow up, you start to do different sorts of events. You'll go for dinner more. You'll go to quieter venues. You'll go to somewhere where there's live music where you can have a conversation. And that is that sort of enjoyment is facilitated more by being sober. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I wonder whether it's a byproduct of of the kind of events that young people typically attend. I wonder whether Darren, my business partner, who's still doing all the voodoo in the UK. I wonder whether he needs to, I don't know, do coffee and cocktail hour at five o'clock in the afternoon well, or something. I don't know. I, I think that's as well, when you're in an environment where everybody else is drunk, like that is, that's full on. When you're sober and you're just looking at people. Yeah. Ugh, it's, it's heavy. Like I'd, I feel like if I'm in an environment where everybody's drunk, I almost need to be drunk just to deal with it. Tolerate it. Correct. Yeah. Looking forward now, you've got, you're doing business stuff. You've got Mm -hmm. clothing, you've got app. You're still growing your platforms. Mm -hmm. As a a guy that from the outside looks like he's accomplished a lot of things and is living an enjoyable life in a desirable city. I actually have no money. Yeah, (laughs) skin to spend it all on this apartment. (laughs) Spend it all on this very expensive apartment. Um, What... Are you are you accumulating skills at the moment? Are you developing yourself? Are there certain things that you've set yourself with regards to goals? I think the uh, the podcasting has massively improved my ability to have a, a conversation, and even only thirteen episodes in. A week. Yeah, I feel like I'm 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 learning a hell of a lot, which is which is good. But I'm doing the podcast more just to help with growing the brand and particularly the networking. Because being in Dubai, there's always so many people coming in and out. And whenever I do meet up with someone who is quite interesting, I end up having a really amazing conversation. I'm like, should have recorded that. Yeah, like this, this needs to be out there. And it's not the right type. Like you can't do, it wouldn't work in a vlog because a vlog you chop things up and it's like you would only take five minutes of it. So that was one reason. And then another one is um, it gives you, it opens doors for meeting very interesting people or people who I respect and want to meet. Thank you. Because <laughs> I, you know, somebody who, say, for example, who's been very successful or they're, they're killing it, making loads of money, I maybe don't really have much to offer them. Maybe I could help them get in shape, but that's not a quick fix. And it's not something I particularly want to do. I don't want to be a personal trainer for celebrities. But when you have an audience and you have a platform, all of a sudden you become... Uh, potentially a good asset to them because if they're releasing a book or they want to spread a message or they want to increase their own following, then coming onto the podcast is going to be exactly what they want. So that's, it's like a strategic thing, Mm -hmm. but I'm also learning a lot at the same time. Is there anything else? Is there anything else that you're thinking at the moment is an area of your life that needs optimizing? Yeah. um, Monetizing the following. Because, uh, yeah, so I think um, I've been good at building a brand and growing a following, but I'm actually quite shit at selling things. You and me both. And, and <laughs> marketing. And me both. So, and it's, it's, it's weird because I guess I never really learned much about it. Like, I, even though I went to school, went to university, you don't get taught how to sell at school, how to market. University... I did economics and business management, but still it was like so heavy on the theory, the maths, the equations. I was like, 
I thought I was going to learn how to run a business here, but I'm not learning any of that. Yeah. So those skills I never really developed. And obviously I got straight into personal training. So I mastered the art of building muscle, losing body, body fat, how to communicate with people, uh, my presentation skills, but no marketing or... It's not commercializing so. stuff. Yeah. This is something that I talk, I like lament about this all the time, just how much is getting left on the table. You know, we both have friends who will have significantly uh, easier weeks with less work, with smaller followings, with less impact, adding less value, making so yeah. much more money. And it's not even necessarily about the money. I don't think that either of us are like, you know, needing more materialism mm. in our lives. But there's just a sense of, well, I'm leaving a lot on the table yeah. here. Uh, and yeah, that's... Because I'm not, I'm not motivated by money. Obviously, you need it. But once you reach a certain amount, <clears throat> you don't really need more. Unless you want... What do you do? Get a slightly nicer yeah. apartment? It would be another 10 floors up or yeah. something. You know, it's... Unless you want to start investing and buying property or you want to build another business, then okay, yeah. <clears throat> but that's the one thing about Dubai is I've, particularly in the past year, I remember I think it was like maybe I got back from traveling last summer and my goal was, look, I just want to build my network. I just want to meet people. I want to meet, I want to surround myself with successful people who are doing very well. And I've met a lot of interesting people in fact, the majority of people who I'm hanging out with now have nothing to do with fitness. They're just extremely successful in their own field. And it's crazy to, like you said, they might have 10,000 followers, 20,000 followers on Instagram. Crushing it. And they're making so much money. I'm like, whoa. Yeah. Like, how are you doing that? Yeah. And they tell me like, oh yeah, the sales funnel. I'm like. Never learned that. What the hell's a sales funnel? Didn't, didn't learn that. Yeah. I, I, th I mean, this is. This is something that will be very interesting to see how the next couple of years develops because I'm very conscious of not like selling out. Yeah, yeah. I've been the same. I don't, I don't, I don't, anyone who watches my content, I very rarely push things Anything. onto my followers. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that in the long term, that's the right way to go about yeah. things, right? Because your, your reputation is something that you can't buy back. Yeah. If you do sell your integrity, there is no refund policy mm -hmm. on that. And whatever it is, it takes a, a, a lifetime to build trust and, and what's one like, bad what's conversation. What's happened with Logan Paul? Like he's just... So, I mean, bit. he's a really good example or a very interesting one because it seems like him and his brother can just steamroll through issues. Mm. You know, the CoffeeZilla thing was really damning it was two-part or three-part series that kind of broke down all of this stuff that logan was doing with his nfts and then coffee goes on rogan and rogan asks him yeah, Who, what's I the biggest thing and then they they pull that and they put that on a clip on rogan's 20 million person youtube channel which gives it another lease of life mm. and meanwhile logan paul is doing wwe and he's making money on prime and he's got all of these businesses I don't know what it is, and I would love for someone to explain it to me. Those guys, both Logan and Jake, have an uncanny ability to just keep moving through obstacles. Yeah. Bad things happen, and it just doesn't phase them. I remember after this Tommy Fury, <coughs> Jake Paul fight, there was a video that he uploaded. It might have even been the first story of the next day on his Instagram, and it was him going, looking at the camera, and being happy and then looking down at, and putting his head in his hands as if he was sad. And the caption below was, when you lost the fight but made 30 mil. And it's like, you can't fucking knock it. You can't <laughs> knock that. Yeah. Um, so there's something happening with them. And I really want to try and deconstruct what's going on. Yeah. Well, I, I think the fighting thing was very good because you, you can't, you've always got to respect someone who's going to step into the ring. Good point. Like you... Even I've not done that. But why is Logan able to continue plowing through these challenges and accusations of, of, of NFT fuckery and stuff? It's, yeah, it's weird. Because it's, it's almost like, maybe because he's been through it before and he knows, yeah, you're going to be the most hated man on the planet for a couple of days or weeks and then people forget about it and then it's just back to business as usual. So he's personally capable of dealing with it. But even that, like, you know, someone could be personally capable and their reputation could be damaged. That should be independent well, of what you, happens to their do reputation. Do you think, let's say, for example, everything that's happened with Liver King, do you think his reputation is 
that because I went on his Instagram the other day and he's still getting loads of likes and comments and views. And I'm like, why are people still watching Unbelievable. it? Unbelievable. I don't know. Like how how is this, how is this okay, still a so thing? Here's one. He was there just with a big plate of testicles. And I just thought, wow. He's Nothing's still, changed. still doing his thing. What do you think about Liver King? <laughs> interesting guy. Very interesting guy. I don't know. I I think it was it was he did so many interviews where he was literally asked whether or not he was natural and he just says like so almost convincingly like no I've never taken anything. I don't feel like that was necessary. I feel like if he just said yeah I was I'm on a bit of this I'm on a bit of that people would have been like oh yeah okay. Because most people, a lot of people in the industry at the moment are taking stuff anyway. It would have undermined his ancestral message though, yeah. right? heavily. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, because he was pushing. All natural thing. Yeah. Apart from those steroids. But I think the, yeah, the, the fact that he was doing that and he'd already sent that email to Derek, like he's playing with fire. Yeah. Like that's, <sighs> I, so... The Liver King thing is kind of fascinating to look at now as a post-mortem. And maybe it is similar to Logan Paul. I've got this idea that I've been playing with for a little while to do with uh, how seduced by success the world is. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you remember Billy McFarlane, the guy that did Fire Festival? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, again, for the people that don't know, this festival, Fire Festival, was supposed to be, it was run on Pablo Escobar's island, and Kendall Jenner was part of the promotion campaign for it, and it was going to be this elite super high class music festival and blink 182 were going to play and it was this amazing headliners and the whole thing turned out to be a car crash mm -hmm. and, and basically people nearly died there was no water there was no nothing but had billy mcfarland managed to pull off even a remotely acceptable event he would have been hailed as a marketing genius as opposed to a charlatan con man and the only difference between how people perceived him was the success of the event. That didn't change the ethics of how he got there mm -hmm. in terms of his marketing practices, how he'd raised money, which was done like incredibly unethically, lying to people about where the money was going and flying back and forth to and from New York and all of this sort of stuff. And what that made me realize is, for as long as you're successful, people will put up with pretty much anything because they are so concerned about being in the trickle-down, cast-off, of your success. They want to bask in the reflective glow of whatever it is that you do so much that they're prepared to forgive pretty much any indiscretion. And this is what will be interesting to see what happens with Tate when mm -hmm. he inevitably comes back into the public limelight, perhaps from a witness box, perhaps from behind bars, or perhaps if he gets released back out into the real world. Because is it going to be the case that he is continuing to grow and have this platform th there has to be it's almost like a balance like a seesaw right on one side you have the amount of success that people want to be associated with and on the other side you have the laundry list of bad things that are happening logan paul like suicide forest nft thing da 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 da, da, da. liver king the, like the steroids and this and maybe there's another scandal that comes and whatever mm. and it's it feels to me like it's a balancing act between the two billy mcfarland you know billy mcfarland's seesaw tipped too far in the other direction Right, he didn't have enough success to hold up the amount of unethical business practices that he was going through. And that thing that I learned watching Fire Festival, like if you're successful, people will forgive an awful lot of indiscretions. I think that's probably quite true. Yeah. What's happening next? What are you working on next? Uh doing a mastermind uh next weekend. So in person? Cool. Yeah, yeah, so we've got 12 people coming to spend the weekend with me. What are Not, they learning? Coaching? Online coaching business? So it's a combination of they they want to see Dubai. They want to get trained by me. They want to learn about how to build a brand, how to build social media. They also want to meet the people I know. So I'll introduce them to my network. So I've got a whole host of events and activities planned over the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I think the highlight will be I've got a big yacht, which I've rented out on the Saturday afternoon. So I I'm came gonna, on the wrong weekend. Yeah, so I'm going to invite literally everybody who I know who is worth knowing and just put everybody together on a nice yacht. So it'll be an opportunity for everyone to just chat. 
And That's really cool. There's yeah. a, a number of um, like builder events in Austin, mm. people that are building shit. Creators, founders, startups, CEOs, writers, podcasters, mm. YouTube, etc. And De- Devin Levesque is doing something cool. He's got a ranch out in Texas. He just followed me. Yeah. He followed me this week. He seems like a cool guy. Yeah, he's he's on it. He's uh, I think he's he's so he's converted a barn and it's like a HQ for him throwing these events. He's got ice baths everywhere. Mm. Like it's it's cool. He's like a building a, a community. I think that's maybe one thing that I've been lacking. Uh, I could definitely do with improving the the community which I have. It could definitely be strengthened. That's you're not the first person to yeah. tell me that in Dubai. Yeah, I think it's a place that because of the way not there's a number of reasons. One of them geographically doesn't really lend itself to that. There's it, it not the let's just go to a local coffee garden and and meet up with 20 of our friends and we can just chat and anybody mm. can invite anybody. That's very common in Austin. Once a week, once every two weeks, there must be one of these events. One of them is called Based in Austin. Dude, 150 people would turn up and just just because. Mm. And people would bring cases of water. People would bring cases of sparkling water and like, one guy would go and get tacos. And, and then you just talk. And then someone would say, uh, I'm actually going to go and give a talk over there about what I've learned to do with decentralized whatever or mm. my new Substack strategy or whatever. People would go and listen yeah. to some dude, just go and talk. So that Th- there needs to be more of that because I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of guys who I've spoken to, they have a hard time networking and meeting people, maybe guys that are older than them or like-minded people who are just, all they want to do is just, grow they want to succeed they want to build and it can be very hard particularly if you come to it like i would imagine there's a hell of a lot of people that come to dubai but they don't know anyone yeah and they're like mike well how do you get yourself to these events luckily for me because obviously I've, I've been here for a while uh, i have a network and i've established myself here so i get invited to a lot of these things but if you're a nobody that can be quite difficult so if there is more of these events where pretty much anybody can attend to like it's in my opinion it's life-changing because you may meet some friends which you'll have for the rest of your life we might have some conversations that will literally cause you to go on a completely different path you know i i just from having a a dinner with a group of friends some people who i didn't know uh some who i did they introduced me to one guy he was the one actually gave me the idea for doing a mastermind and i was like I actually never really thought about doing that. But then it made sense because this, there's so many people every day that message me saying, hey, Mike, I'm in Dubai. Can I meet you? Or can I train with you? Can I do this? Can I do that? So now this is obviously going to be a tester. It's a small scale thing. It's only 12 people. But if this goes well and I enjoy it, then maybe I can do it again in the future on a larger scale. Well, this speaks to, again, one of the challenges, both young guys and young girls and older people as well. Perhaps it even gets worse as you get older that making friends, having a community, yeah. you know, having a support group. Uh, I, I feel very, very fortunate that Austin is just, it's like overpowered when it comes to community and socializing. It's mm-hmm. insane. I've never, ever, ever been anywhere that is so hyper social. And it's dinners. It's dinners and everything's finished by 8.30 p.m. because everyone's got to get up in the morning to go and do stuff, mm-hmm. right? Or they've got to get back to look after the dog. So it's not hedonistic. It never gets... A, Maybe I don't get invited, but that never gets out of control, I'm pretty sure. And that has been so, for me, really mm. nourishing, fulfilling, and it's filled a massive hole that I thought I needed. Um, and yeah. Because yeah. cause all my my really cr- close friends, like all party boys. Yeah. And I can't, I mean, obviously I'll link up with them every now and then and, you know. Unsustainable, regular friendships unsustainable yeah. you're gonna yeah. kill me <laughs> mike i appreciate the fuck out of you man it's very very cool to have watched what you've done over the last whatever 15 16 years since we've been mates and uh i'm looking forward to seeing how the podcast continues to grow for people that are listening that want to check out the stuff that you do where should they go so just search search for mike thurston on any platform my website thirst official you can pick up a pair of sexy shorts if you want to and then uh podcast channel is first things thirst i appreciate you thanks man What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.